Hi, and welcome to Chapter 5. In today's chapter, we're going to be talking about ethics and corporate social responsibility. Some of the key issues we'll be discussing in this chapter are stakeholders, missions, goals, and objectives for firms, managerial ethics, the agency problem, corporate social responsibility, sometimes referred to in the textbook as CSR, and corporate stakeholders. Okay, so let's start with stakeholders. <clears throat> who are the stakeholders? Well, these are people who are going to be involved with the company. So it could be individuals or groups somehow affected or influenced by the organization. We'll go into more depths of who these stakeholders are and what their goals are. The mission is sort of derived from the mission statement. It's the reason the firm exists. It's what the firm is made to do. And that primarily is detailed in the mission statement of a firm. Now the goals and objectives of a firm, you know, uh, these can also times be stated in the mission statement or somewhere should be organized in, uh, somewhere in the company to know what, you know, what are the desired goals for this company to reach. Maybe they're sales goals, maybe they're different product goals, maybe they're bigger goals. And the objectives, how are they going to quantify meeting these goals? So what is you know the specific obje objectives that would lead lead up to achieving these goals you know so a company really needs to a company just doesn't do things on the fly they need to think ahead about the people that they affect and they need to think about you know what the company is supposed to do and how they're supposed to get there and this is what you know a the, the better a company does in stating this information the easier it'll be for their employees to achieve this information. Okay, so let's specifically talk about stakeholders. So some of the stakeholders involved here, you can see of course the owners are a stakeholder in a company. Um, the customers, believe it or not, are, have, are, have a stake in the company as well because customers could de de depend on your company for critical materials or components for their company or consumers who depend on your company for products that they need for their, you know, it could be a medical product, a drug um, that they need to survive. So customers can be a very big stakeholder in the firm, as well as the government. The government can be involved in such companies as Boeing and certainly defense companies like um, Northrop Grumman, uh, BAE, and things like that, where the government has a stake in uh, because it's buying the products of the company or it's funding research in the company, or maybe just generally it's hiring citizens of the country. Employees, of course, are stakeholders. These are people who work for the company, and you can see quite clearly why they would have a stake, because they get their livelihood from the company. Suppliers, who also get the livelihood from the company by supplying them raw materials or maybe subcontracted um, products. So suppliers are also, also considered a stakeholder, as well as lenders. Anybody lending the company money, they have a stake in the company succeeding because they don't get paid back if the company doesn't succeed. Community. The community that the company lives in. So, um, you know, many defense companies polluted the communities they lived in, and they didn't really take into account the stakeholders, the community who, that was hosting the company, and oftentimes uh, not just defense companies, but textile companies, um, other companies that had hazardous waste, didn't properly dispose of it, would affect the community. So nowadays, Companies need to recognize the community that they operate in as a stakeholder and to you know respect the community and not pollute them. And society in general, the the society with the business. So society is just sort of a much larger community. So does the business overall contribute to the society? And they have to look at their contributions to the society as a stakeholder. Um, so you can see there's a lot of individuals and groups who are going to be affected by these organizations. So when they make goals, decisions, um, set strategy, they have to take into account how that's going to affect the different stakeholders and how the organizational goals are going to influence the different stakeholders to a certain degree. Now, sometimes decisions, you can't win in all of the stakeholder groups with every decision. So you might make a decision to increase the prices of the product which is going to increase profits which will be beneficial to the owners and the employees but might be a little detrimental to the customers as the prices are going to increase so there you know so there's decisions there where you know maybe the owners of the company decide to move the company part of the company's production overseas 
uh, for cheaper production manufacturing. That's going to affect the government, who's going to get less taxes from the employees, who are, who are going to be less employees employed in the current society, say uh, the U.S. society that the company is operating in. So it might be more beneficial to owners, but it could affect the community, society, government, and employees, um, certain decisions they make. So these decisions have to be somewhat balanced, where you're not necessarily... Um, doing too much damage to one area, but in some cases a decision has to be made that's best for the owners that may be not always best for some of the stakeholders. So it's a very a very sensitive area, but good companies will at least think about these decisions and think about how they affect their stakeholders before they make them. Okay, let's talk about the agency problem. Okay, if you work for a company, you know, this agency problem, we're pretty much going to mostly talk about managers, but it can exist at any level of the company. So if you're working for a company, you have you know moral and ethical responsibility to provide your knowledge and expertise and your time uh, ethically to the company. So if you've ever taken office supplies from a company that's dealing, that's an agency problem because you're putting your needs above the needs of the company. So you're thinking that you need some copy paper and you're going to take 30 sheets of copy paper home or a couple of pens uh, for your personal use. Well, that's going to personally benefit you, but it's it's a drain on the resources of the company, an agency problem. Uh, if you're at a company and you're not working, but instead you're playing on Facebook or communicating on Facebook or answering personal emails, that's an agency problem because now you're taking time away, which time from when you should be working for the agency and you're doing personal things. You know, so we've pretty much all been guilty of some of these agency problems, but managers, you know, face a situation a little bit more acute because they're the agent of the owner, more direct agent of the owner, so they have to put the company's best interests first. And when a manager puts their own best interests first, that could be very detrimental to the business. So we're not talking about the cost of a few pens or some copy paper here, but a manager could do things like pick a more expensive contract for a supplier or a service or a subcontractor because he received a cash kickback. So the company winds up paying millions of dollars more for this contract because he selected it because they gave him, say, $100,000. Or maybe they gave him um, front row tickets to a concert or a sports game. Or, you know, um, I worked for a company once where they picked a more expensive oil supplier because the oil supplier promised the um, operations manager to fill his oil tank back at home for free. You know, so these are these are things where it's you're doing something for your best interest, not the company's best interest. And we can root this into um, something called moral hazard, where when the parties in the arrangement, such as owners and managers, do not share equally in the risks and the benefits. So if you're a manager of a company and you are not going to, um, there's no profit sharing or there's no incentive to make the company grow and make more profits where you would share in that somehow, you might be more tempted to do things that are going to benefit yourself rather than the company. Now, so it, companies need to really, when they deal with managers and directors and things of that nature, they need to uh, create a situation where the risks and the benefits of the company are a little bit more equal, so their alignment, their decisions are in alignment with the owners. So, when we talk about adverse selection, this is the inability of uh, shareholders to identify a precise, the the perfect and competent uh, personal attributes of top managers when they're hired. So, this adverse selection is they may hire the wrong people to run the company. So, interviewing process can be kind of difficult and you may see a lot of candidates but you don't really truly know how exactly they're going to contribute or how well they're going to do for you as your agent so sometimes you know the the, the very people the board of directors who are hiring you know these managers they could make a mistake and not hire the best person or hire someone that looks really good in paper but in person is terrible okay so let's look at this agency perspective in um, Perspective one, uh, management serves its own interests. So management should be looking out for what's the best interest of the company. So, you know, executives seek to grow the firm because compensation 
tends to increase with the size of the company. So if you're an executive and the company gets bigger, your pay should get bigger. So that sort of puts you uh, in the line of serving your own interests. So you want the company to do well, so you do well. Um, the executives may diversify the firm to increase the perspective of survival at the expense of profitability. So um, now here, if you diversify the firm, that could make the firm less risky or less chance, you know, because they're in many different businesses. Um, so it's going to increase the survival chances of the firm, but sometimes that you know, could be at the expense, if it's at the expense of profitability, you may not be doing what's in the owner's best interest. So this is a tricky one. Sometimes diversification makes sense, and it is in both the manager's and the owner's interest. But sometimes if you are diversifying, you're in a business that you could do well, and you can make 20% profits in, and there's plenty of room to grow, and, you know, it is a little risky, and if that's where the, you know, the business wants to be, and the owner's wants to be, but then you decide to convince them to move into a little bit safer business with much lower returns, um, that might be going against what the the, st the, sh the stakeholders and the owners and the shareholders want from the company. Because some uh, of the owners, or definitely some of the shareholders, may buy the company for its you know growth potential, and and they are accepting the risks because of the growth, the return possibilities of the company. So if the managers you know see that that is too risky, they may change the nature of the business to benefit themselves. Let's look at this agency perspective number two. Management and stakeholders share same interests. Okay, so we look at we talked about who the stakeholders are before. So you know, the managers are one of the stakeholders, and of course their income, their livelihood is tied into the success of the business. So they t tend to manage it in the best interests of the stakeholders because it's in their best interest too that the company grows and prof prospers and survives. Now stock options can support this perspective by turning managers into more owners so that's why stock options are very um, popular among top management is it gives you an ownership stake in a company so that way you become more of an owner as well as a manager and there, thereby you want you have a clearer picture of the owner's perspective not just the manager's perspective so things a manager could do managers may you know sometimes not always think about um, they may think about short-term versus long-term, and if you have the perspective ver of the manager as well as the stakeholder, then you could balance those short-term interests and those long-term interests to make a more successful company. So this is one way of encouraging managers to be in alignment with the stockholders. Okay, let's talk about managerial ethics. So managers need to have ethics, and we have uh, here, move this picture down. There we go. So here's a, as a manager, he's having a bad day, obviously. He's, um, or maybe he's just tired and wants to take a little nap. But I think more, more logically than not, he got caught in some ethical snafu. So a manager is a person. So they have a responsibility to make business decisions that are legal, honest, moral, and fair. So now, legal and honest. You know, those can be two different things, but hopefully mostly they're the same thing. Uh, now, of course, legal is going to be things that are following the law. But sometimes you there are loopholes to the law that you can do that might be kind of dishonest. Not illegal, but not strictly honest. So managers need to think of not only the legal aspects that they're following, but also the honesty of what they're doing uh, to, the na to be fair. Uh, to the stakeholders and owners and not try to do something you know that might be technically legal but kind of dishonest now agreeing on what is moral and fair can be difficult as well so moral different people have different moral compasses so morality is really within the person I think fairness is an easier concept where and again it's an internal interpretation where you want to be fair, meaning that you don't want to take advantage. You want to be fair, say, to your customers, and you want to provide them a fair price on the product, or your employees want to give them a fair wage. But a lot of times companies give their employees a very unfair, immoral wage that uh, is just the name of making extra profits. And such as some companies have hired, hired children of impoverished third world countries to manufacture clothes that 
you know, is very immoral. Um, is it legal? You know, maybe in that foreign country it's legal, but it, you know, it's not strictly, um, a lot of times these facts aren't being told to the investors and managers try to cover it up, which is very dishonest. So, in my experience, the more ethical you are, the more uh, fair you are and honest you are as a manager, the less trouble you'll be in. So you may not be, you may not always be the top performing, highest performing manager with the best returns this way, but you'll be a, a more steady, reliable, um, trustworthy figure in the company. And uh, I just realized that this guy has handcuffs on, <laughs> so that's probably why he's upset. And I did work for a company that the my boss was doing something illegal. He was falsifying revenue receipts. And I wound up leaving the job after only working there uh, two weeks because of this. And he later, and this was a company, a local company, he later was arrested. And you could see him on News 12 being arrested and taken out of the company in handcuffs because of his falsification of revenues that was uh, dishonest to, the, you know, everybody, the government, the taxes, the employees, the stakeholders, the investors. It really was just trying to uh, goose up short-term sales and profit goals in order to um, make you know make himself meet his his goals for the quarter make himself look better and you know it's just you know just very and a lot of companies in the late 1990s early 2000s got caught up in this uh, unethical behavior of falsifying revenues and profits to make their stock look better and basically make their stock price go up and that's one of the um, problems of, of providing too many sh too many shares of stock to managers and owners because now their motive may be just to get the stock price up and not do what's best for the company in the long term but do what's best for the stock price in the short term so this is something that could be you know another moral hazard another um, ethical uh, issue with dishonesty in managers so it's a tough issue so as a company as the owners of companies you really would want to work with more ethical more honest more moral people because they're going to be um, do what's right by everybody and it will lead to less lawsuits less issues less arrests and it's just you know as an employee you should always strive to be as honest and transparent as you can and when I first started out I started out as accounting and an accountant when I when I was my first part of my career, and I was not the best accountant. <laughs> I made a lot of mistakes. I could sometimes I couldn't balance my balance sheet. But you know what? I never hid the fact. I was always honest about it. When when there was a problem or issue was discovered, I never tried to cover it up. I was just always very, yep, it's probably me. I might have made a mistake. Let's look at this. And so I wasn't the best accountant, but I was honest and, and open, and transparent about what I did. So that kept me out of trouble because I saw far more talented people who couldn't accept the fact that they made a mistake and they would argue and they would try to cover it up and eventually there's no covering up in accounting eventually it's discovered and they were fired so you know many times I received promotions or um, staying power at, at this first company I worked at gently because you know they couldn't they couldn't really catch me in a lie or catch me in doing something dishonest with the journal entries or the books because I was always very open and transparent about things and that turns out is more important in an accountant than being accurate in some of your entries and, you know I made some journal entries that you know created you know a million dollar errors that were quickly well they were discovered but I mean there is a way I could have I mean sometimes I've discovered them and had to say listen I made this error here this is what I'm going to do to fix it other people would just try and fix that error in a way that you know it would be it would come out in an audit report and they'd say what is this transaction here because it looks very suspicious so it's always it was always better I thought to document it and let people know this happened this is how I fixed it and then but we need to know this moving forward that um, and a lot of accountants wouldn't do that and they would get in big trouble and a big part of that was their ego. They thought they were these great, wonderful, smart accountants. And uh, when it comes to accountancy, I knew that I wasn't that great at it. So I've never tried to, uh, I never had much ego for it. And eventually, it wasn't my passion or interest. I eventually moved on to finance and, and other corporate positions that I liked much better. Okay, so six perspectives on managerial ethics. So these are different perspectives. Nothing's, you know, it's just different ways of looking at it, different influences that we can talk about. Uh, utilitarian view. So this is um, anticipated outcomes and consequences should be 
the only considerations when evaluating an ethical dilemma. So this is looking at it in a very crisp way, just saying, okay, what are potential outcomes and consequences of these actions, of these managerial ethics? And that's what's the only thing that should be considered in a very sterile environment. So that's one perspective, just looking at the exact, you know, outcomes and consequences of an action um, as far as judging its ethicalness. Now, a self-interest view, these are benefits of the decision makers should be the primary considerations. So, um, so in the managers, in the ethics perspective of the manager, they're looking more at, you know, the alignment of the benefits of decisions to um, is going to be their primary consideration in, in judging whether or not something's ethical. It's probably not the best view. The rights view, evaluating uh, organization decisions based on the extent that they protect the basic individual rights. So it's looking at ethics more through the, uh, the rights of people, employees, owners. Uh, uh, are the decisions going to you know, protect their basic rights or is it going to violate them? So they can look at the ethical, ethical perspective that way. Another ethical perspective is just a justice view. Um, so this justice view is decisions will be made in accordance with pre-established rules and guidelines. So you would really just look at, are they following the rules and the guidelines? And if they are, then it's ethical. If they aren't, it's unethical. But we know one problem with this justice view is that sometimes people can find uh, loopholes that are unethical, but you know not strictly against the rules. So in that case, new rules have to be made to close up those loopholes. And this is why usually this justice perspective isn't always the best, because if someone's going to be unethical, they'll find a way. But if someone is a more ethical, or moral person, they're not going to try to bend the rules to their advantage, uh, just so they would be viewed justice-wise as correct. Um, interrogative social contracts, uh, I'm sorry, integrative social contracts, uh, these decisions are based on existing norms of behavior, including cultural, community, and industry factors. So, basically, these social contracts are, you know, you live in a society, <clears throat> and there's certain behaviors that are considered normal and okay culturally. So, in some cultures, believe it or not, uh, bribes or additional compensation is considered okay. So, if you're, if you want to get things done culturally these small bribes or these um, small favors are culturally okay not considered immoral and ethical but in other societies like the United States there's actually laws where we say you cannot bribe a foreign official you cannot bribe you know any or any you can't use bribes to win favors in other foreign countries even if it's their cultural norm you know um, religious view uh, making a decision based on your personal religious uh, Convictions and the problem with this is, you know, most religions their convictions are pretty okay, but sometimes the religious convictions are not in alignment with community or laws. You know, and you could have a case where <clears throat> you have a baker who says, "I'm not going to sell a cake to you because I don't believe in and 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 religiously I don't believe what you're doing is is ethical or moral, so I'm not going to sell you that cake, uh, or I'm going to deny services. I'm not going to provide you those flowers." And strictly on, you know, religious grounds, so using the religious ethical. Now, many times um, that's going to be in direct conflict with the justice system, the laws, the rights of certain people. So a religious view can, can, can contradict with, um, you know, social contracts, with the justice, it could be against the law, uh, with the rights of certain individuals. So that perspective, you know, can lead to problems. Now, and this is this is interesting because some sometimes some country some companies may be more religious in their orientation. So you could get a company like um, Chick Fil A that, because of their religious convictions, will not be open on Sunday. And there are many businesses, um, say in Brooklyn, that won't be open on Saturday due to religious convictions. So now they're doing they're doing their decision not to open on businesses not to open on Saturday or Sunday, you know, uh, maybe, you know, it's, they feel it's correct because that's what their religion says. But if you're a uh, public company and you're losing a day's worth of sales because you don't want to be open on a Sunday, that could go against the, um, 
you know, the ethical contracts and the social contracts with some of the shareholders that don't believe in that religious view. Okay, six expl explanations for unethical behavior. Um, so why do people why do people act unethically? Why do people cheat in college? Why do people cheat at work? Why do people cheat on their marriage? Why do people steal? Why do people lie? Um, you know, sometimes we could say that individuals deny responsibility. So they rationalize that they have no other choice but to participate in this unethical behavior. So they rationalize that, you know, they're given too much work to do in school, and if they don't cheat or collude with other students, there, you know, uh, then there's no way they'll ever be able to pass college, and this is how you have to do it to be able to survive and get through it. So that's sort of you're denying the responsibility and, of not cheating or being ethical because you're, you're justifying it somehow. You know, individuals may deny injury, so they suggest that the unethical behavior did not hurt, really hurt anybody. So maybe uh, you say to yourself, oh, you know, I snuck into, uh, I saw one movie, and then I snuck into a second movie for free. But I didn't hurt anybody, I didn't, you know, so there's really no harm, no foul. But you know what, you did, because somebody made that movie, and people put money invested in that movie, and they should be compensated for viewing that movie. Or, you know, if you illegally downloaded music or streamed uh, some uh, video content online, it's a big problem for shows like Game of Thrones, where people don't pay for HBO, but they find uh, illegal download or, screening or streaming copies online, and they just deny injuries, saying they're not hurting anybody, so it's ethical, which, which it's not. You're still stealing, in a sense. Uh, individ individuals deny rights of the victim, so they rationalize that they, you know, they deserve what they're going to get anyway. So, you know, people may steal from a large corporation and say, "Well, that corporation has been ripping me off for years," or they may steal from work and they feel like, you know, I didn't get that raise I should have gotten, or they didn't give me a raise this year, so this is my raise. I'm just taking this cash, you know. Uh, so they can sort of rationalize what they're doing and make it, you know. Um, ethical based on the fact that they're serving justice of their own accord. Um, individuals engage in social weighing by making careful and controlled comparisons. So, you know, you can kind of say, um, you could look at, when we talk about the social weighing, you know, so this could be by, you know, you're looking at comparisons. So you're saying, you know, um, on my expense report I can falsify um, some expenses that really weren't business related, but it's okay because in comparison, the company is, you know, uh, stealing a huge amount of uh, contracts from other companies by being unethical in their way that they're um, competing for these contracts. Or, you know, so somehow you're weighing what you're doing compared to the overall unethicalness of something else that may be happening at the company. So you're weighing the fact that, oh, this is really minor compared to um, whatever else is going on. So you could say something like, you know, oh, I, you know, I didn't download the movie because that's, that's really wrong to download the movie. But I did stream it and, it, you know, streaming and watching a, a, a movie over a stream that you know that you know rather than you know stealing the copy of a movie is much worse so you could, so maybe you're saying it like this may be a clear example i didn't go into the book i didn't go into the uh best buy and steal a, did a dvd copy of the movie that's clearly wrong and people are doing that all i did was watch the movie online through a, an illegal streaming service and so by comparison i'm really not doing anything too bad and that's like social weighing uh, okay, so individuals can appeal to the higher values by suggesting that justification for the unethical behavior is due to higher uh, values. So it's basically, you know, saying that you know I'm uh, I'm conducting this unethical behavior, but it makes sense because I'm arguing that um, you know some degree of degree of lower unethical behavior in pursuit of the ethical responsibility at a higher level. So it's it's basically saying that um, trying to justify it again. So here, the example that's used in the book is a sales rep who is um, brought in to help resolve a dispute between a customer and another sales rep may deny the legitimacy, the legitimate claims of the customer, rationalizing that loyalty among sales representatives is a higher uh, order. So you know, so individuals may invoke this, you know, um, this sort of this thinking that 
uh, you're going to the, you know, justify your unethical behavior because um, you're appealing to an, a higher value somewhere else. So it's really just kind of uh, warped thinking to allow to, to convince yourself it's okay. Um, and if we talked about number six, this is the last one, a metaphor of the ledger. So you're arguing that uh, you might have the right to engage in certain unethical practices because of other good things that you've done. So you know you might you might have said that you know I um, okay I stole a lot of money but I donated half that to charity, or um, you might be padding your travel expense account um, because you've done more of your shares worth of traveling and helping the company grow. So you're saying to yourself, uh, yeah, I've, I've padded the traveling expense because I've actually helped the company grow by 10% this year on the specific trips I've taken. So it's really just a little, it was just a little justified payback for what, because all the hard work I've been doing. So that's, you know, it, it, it's trying to justify something bad by something good that you've done that, you know, of course, uh, that's not, correct way of thinking either. So these are different things. So the, the basic explanation is people come up, convince themselves of why their unethical behavior is okay. So they, they, they do know it's unethical, their behavior, but they figure out a way to convince themselves that it's okay. And you know what? It's not okay. Okay, so let's move on to CSR, corporate social responsibility. So social responsibility is going to, you know, of course, we social responsibility is your a business's responsibility to society um, to serve not just society but also the owners and shareholders and their financial needs so where ethics is more about the person social responsibility is more about the firm the firm's actions and the firm's um, what the firm does even though there's individuals behind those decisions for what the firm's doing we think of social responsibility at the firm corporate level so you know, we use this acronym uh, CSR because co corporate social responsibility is a you know a long word to keep saying. Now, some pros and cons. Now, um, if you're one of the big pros, of course, is that you want customers to view your company as valuable to society and giving back to society because they feel better about your company and thereby they'll do more business transactions with you. Um, so, you know, a lot of these pros and cons can be debated, what, you know, but, you know, there's a lot of argu arguments for giving back to the community because you want to um, include this in your message to the consumer in terms of advertising at the at the product development and community involvement. So you, so you may, you know, if, you're, if your company is donating money for you know toys for children or uh, a, lo a local homeless shelter or a food bank or even bigger causes you want to make sure that you know your customers know about it so they feel uh, good about the company and want to buy more from you but you have to be careful because you may donate to certain causes that not all of your customers agree with so there's certain uh, conservative and liberal causes out there that you might donate to. For example, you may, be, you may donate to uh, a, some, a church activity or help a local church out, but then some of your customers may not agree with the, um, the church's opinions on a lot of issues. So you got to be careful on the social responsibility, picking things like usually helping children or supporting homeless or, or, food, shelter or food banks are pretty universally loved. So it, it can be, you know, challenging. And you have some companies like, um, if you look at British Petroleum, they spend a lot of money advertising in commercials that they're a green company. That we advertise, and they advertise, I've seen commercials for this, and they even change their corporate colors to be white and green to seem more, econ you know, environmentally friendly. And they, they, you know, they advertise they've done a lot of research on alternative fuels and wind power and solar power. But the truth is they spend more money advertising this information that they actually spent in research development of alternative energies because that's sort of you know a competitor to their business model which is pumping out oil and making gasoline uh, and a lot of this is, you know goodwill they had from these commercials and their their pro environment status was destroyed when they had that Exxon Mobil uh, not the when they had the uh, the offshore oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico uh, due to uh, installing um, a cheaper alternative, legal 
and it met regulations, but they put in they didn't put in the best equipment in that rig, and they they blew and spilled a whole bunch of oil in the Gulf of Mexico and made a huge, terrible uh, environmental disaster down there. So all that goodwill they tried to generate was pretty much destroyed for probably a, lo a long time. And the same thing happened to Exxon Mobil when they had a big oil spill in Alaska, and they you know they had to clean that up, but that's still that you know, we still wait on that company for a long time. Now, um, we talk about triple bottom line. It's the notion that firms must maintain and improve social and ecological performance in addition to economic performance. So not only do they have to make sure they make a profit, but they have to do it in a way that is going to be improving the society and improving the environment. So people, planet, and profit is sort of what companies today and consumers are expecting companies to strive for they strive for you know doing what's better for people um, the community what's better for the planet the uh, you know the society and the environment and to make profits for um, the company and do it in a sustainable way so this triple bottom line now managers have to focus not just on profits but also you know these two other um, areas that are more closely linked to CSR because if if they don't then there's a backlash from customers that you're an evil organization that are not benefiting society now why would a company not want to be focused on social responsibility um, you know so it may firms may only be looking at this if it's going to enhance profits so if managers don't really know what's the best interest of society or what's the best way to give back uh, they shouldn't spend the shareholders money on charities and contributions if they're not sure that that's what the shareholders want uh, because sometimes the shareholders rather have their profits go to them and then they personally make the contributions to charities so instead of having so instead of, think of it this way you know we could give you a dividend check for five thousand um, dollars or we can give you a dividend check f for zero so if we give you a dividend check for five thousand dollars we're not making any social uh, contributions to charities as a company but if we if we um, if we give you a zero dividend check then we're gonna make on your behalf we're gonna donate to organizations so that is something that a lot of shareholders say no 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 <laughs> give me the five thousand dollar bonus I'll donate to charity that way I can deduct it off of my taxes and I can decide where that money's gonna go so some managers look at it that way um, so they they think they don't need to give back uh, that they're ready you know may feel that they're already serving society providing a lot of jobs and tax revenue and that the government will redistribute the tax revenue into a needy populations and needy charities um, so as far as a stakeholders perspective you want the business to be good and strong but you don't want um, the company to give away all the profits to social activity so it's a balancing act you want to do what's you know what you could say socially acceptable for a company to char charity or donation to make and that's also acceptable to shareholders um, and you also want to be responsible as far as you don't want to be that's just on a giving side the other side is you know being responsible for taking care of the environment for uh, disposing of your wastes for you know these are things that could eventually prevent government regulation so if an industry is really taking advantage of society or polluting or you know uh, doing things that are hurting the overall planet economy or society the government might step and say okay here here are our new regulations are on controlling your pollution controlling your waste how a uh, minimum wage you pay your employees so these are things that they have to balance out you know you know if we don't do it the government's going to step in and probably make us do it okay now, uh, sustainable strategic management. So this SSM, sustainable strategic management, is the notion that you know when we think about social responsibility, we think about strategies that are going to promote um, better performance for both the company, the market, and the environmental perspective. So we want sustainable answers. So it might be something like, okay, using fossil fuels to jump to uh, power my factories is not really a sustainable approach but I could switch to solar panels and maybe they're going to be cheaper than um, using fossil fuels so I'll be able to improve the performance of my company and help the environment and be shown as a social responsibility corporate champion so it, you're trying to integrate 
what's something that we could do that's going to better serve society but also better generate profit so basically a win-win scenario so something long-term and sustainable so you could be a company that says okay we're going to rage we're going to raise wages uh, currently we're paying minimum wages to our employees we're going to raise that we're going to double their pay but in order to do that we're going to put in certain um, labor labor saving uh, equipment or technology so as we grow we don't have to hire new employees we can use these new technologies to substitute for new employees so we can grow as a company and pay our current employees more money because of these la labor saving technologies so something I ideas like that where it's a win-win for stakeholders society environment um, now let's switch over to takeovers so what is a takeover so basically it's just like it sounds like someone's gonna take over your company and and we have that classic picture down here of a fish eating a fish eating a fish. So basically, a larger company will purchase control of a smaller company, and um, you know, and they can do that through either you know the company, an individual, or a group of investors can take over another company, and they can do things like uh, so. A leverage buyout is you know uh, a company borrowing, or it could be a company, a group of investors, a capital group borrowing lots of money. And then basically what they do is they take that money and they buy the other company. But the other company is going to hold a lot of the debt that they took to buy that company. So Dunkin' Donuts is an example of a, of a company that they, they leverage buyout. They bought the company. And then usually they try to add some value. They rehabilitate and they fix the company off. They make it a little bit more valuable. And then they could take, in the case of Dunkin' Donuts, they issued it as a stock. And they used the stock to pay sell back pay themselves a lot back for their investment, also pay off some of the debt, and help the company expand uh, later on. So leverage buyout is a very popular way to take over a company. So what are some pros and cons of a uh, company takeover? Well, one pro, uh, uh, of course, is that um, they say it's a, you know a system of checks and balances. So it could be it could be a way of you know if a company is not doing well. That another company could come in um, to initiate the change for for ineffective management and uh, inefficient companies. Now, you know, for example, uh, Hostess Foods, the maker of Twinkies, they uh, they weren't taken over, but they went bankrupt because of really poor management decisions. And later, the part of their company, um, their company's assets were sold off. So another company essentially did take over and continue making Twinkies but it wasn't a traditional takeover because you know some some companies are so uh, badly managed and have such horrible contracts and, and and so much obligations to legacy employees that they just go bankrupt but still the the company's products or assets if they're valuable to live on they'll be sold off and the proceeds going to the remaining de uh, debt holders um, and there's some companies like Costco uh, not Costco uh, there's some companies like Cisco and Google that routinely buy a lot of small, take over a lot of small technology companies to keep themselves uh, on the technological innovation forefront of things that they haven't been able to develop in-house. And it would be very expensive to develop in-house, so it's a lot cheaper to buy a smaller, more innovative company. Now, um, the threat of a takeover can pressure managers to operate the firm more e efficiently, effectively. So if a company is has value, there could be corporate you know, raiders or, or takeover people who, are, who could possibly threaten the company. And, and usually why managers are worried because when the company is taken over, you're going to be fired as a manager or director, your job's over. So that's going to really motivate you to make sure that the company is uh, tip-top shape, running very effectively and not a good takeover target. Because takeover targets are companies that, like a Dunkin' Donuts, it has a good product, has a good, you know, brand. It's just not being run very well. So it makes the company less valued and it gets to a point, sort of like flipping a house. You find a house that has a low price because it's in bad shape. You come in, you fix the house up and you sell it for a profit. Same concept of a lot of these takeovers. Now a con could be, um, you know, the money, you know, to pay back these large loans can, you know, make managers overemphasize profits in the short term, and the extra debt load for a leveraged buyout can lead sometimes lead to bankruptcy if the turnaround of the the business is not you know successful. Just like if you if you've ever watched the show Flip or Flop, sometimes they buy a house and they try to turn it around, but they wind up selling it at a loss because they put more money into it to fix it up than they could sell it in the market. So there are definitely some real problems with the uh, 
takeovers. Now let's move on to um, outsourcing and uh, offshoring. So, so you're a company, right? So you're a manufacturer, and you're making, you know, your products in the United States, and then then suddenly you're becoming less uh, competitive. So why are you less competitive? It could be the amount of money you're paying for the manufacturing of your products or the money you're paying for certain services from employees. So you can outsource some non-revenue producing activities of the organization, human resources, uh, IT, um, even accounting, even customer service can be outsourced to other companies that can do your customer service calls or do your sales calls, uh, prepare your accounting, uh, uh, host your servers and manage your IT. Uh, so outsourcing, you know, so you, I've seen firsthand in my work experience, you know, uh, accounting part, uh, departments going from 50 people down to 20 people due to outsourcing or even in increasing technology. The big area where a lot of jobs were lost were in payroll departments. So payroll departments could be anywhere from two to seven people, depending on the size of the firm. And then companies commonly outsource their payroll to ADP, who, who does all the payroll work and produces the checks and, and handles all the legal matters. And it shrinks the payroll department from, you know, um, four to anywhere from four to seven people all the way down to one or two people. Uh, and the same thing for IT. I've seen companies have ra rather large IT staffs, 20, 25 people, shrunk down to five people when they outsource a lot of the um, the, the work. Uh, now, offshore offshoring uh, is related to outsourcing, but offshoring could be the fact that a common example is that you have a, a manufacturing plant, maybe you make... Uh, running shoes and it's just too expensive to make it the labor prices here so you shift your manufacturing plant to Vietnam where they have a much lower cost of labor and you reduce your labor costs but you also may be reducing your utility costs your taxes so you can um, offshore to a different country you you um, can remain you know it, the benefit is the costs are definitely going to be lower, but you lose some control of the operations when it's abroad rather than when it's in-house. So other firms are going to have, you know, they're going to be there with the product on the floor, and it's not so easy where you can just walk down to the factory part of your business and observe what's being done or fix problems more quickly. It, it does make managing a little bit more tough when you're offshoring. And, and by and large, over the last 30 years, a lot of businesses have been offshored to other countries to make textiles and, and electronics and sneakers and uh, you know, I guess apparel as that would be under and um, a lot of industries you know utility appliances and you know all offshore to cheaper uh, countries for lower wages now that's good for the company makes more profits but it's bad for the host country that loses a lot of those jobs so uh, that can have a negative um, looked at your company can be looked at negatively if you you to get too greedy with doing this but by and large the trend has been companies have been outsourcing and offshoring their parts of their operations to save money and other countries are you know I think uh, India at one point had a very large um, English speaking population that made a lot of money taking over customer service operations for a lot of American countries at a much lower cost as a you know a classic example now so this this can affect the US trade deficit which is a big concern because are we usually in deficit with most countries specifically China and Mexico um, because a lot of jobs and a lot of out offshoring and outsourcing have occurred in these two countries so now when they produce those goods and they get imported back to this country to be sold here that's going to increase the trade deficit and that's something that you know is a negative for the country we we don't we want a more you know trade deficits you know surpluses and deficits are always going to be there it's never going to be completely balanced but if it gets too out of control that could be a problem because it has to be financed and funded so uh, now the white collar jobs are, are being outsourced including attorneys and accountants and even college professors to other countries through the advent of you know the internet and, and skyping and remote access so white collar jobs are now as vulnerable as manufacturing jobs but the cost cutting incentives you know it makes it, it makes it for companies are having to um, really think about 
putting this outsourcing offshoring together to save money for labor. So if you're a more physical company like a restaurant or a fast food company, you can't outsource your, you know, you have to hire domestic citizens. But, you know, if you could put kiosks in, I was recently at a um, airport in Seattle and they had a, I went to a McDonald's there and they had three kiosks running where you can put your order and pay for your order through a kiosk, which was very easy, or wait in line. The choice was wait in line for about 10, 15 minutes to get a, to talk to an actual person to put your order in or go to the kiosk. And I chose the kiosk and, it, you know, I got my food a lot faster. And they, instead of having to pay four people to man registers, they only had to pay one person and then you had three kiosks. And even Shake Shack in the city is developing, uh, have developed a store location where it's all kiosks. There's no cash registers, no um, there's no person taking your order. So it's a way of, you know, reducing these costs when you can't, because you're not always able to outsource or offshore your, um, work. Okay. So that's it for chapter five. I look forward to, to, uh, talking to you and working with you on chapter six. We're going to start getting into corporate level strategies until then take care.